Section 24 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11. The Ascendancy of France. Part 1. Before undertaking the restoration of his kingdom, Henry IV had to deal with the insecurity of his frontiers. Between France and the Spanish possessions in Italy lay Savoy, whose interests were thus both French and Italian. Her duke aimed at becoming Count of Provence and playing a leading part in French affairs. His reluctance to surrender Saluzzo according to the papal award led to war, in which the invaders carried all before them. The duke agreed to give up to France Bresse and Bouget in exchange for Saluzzo, and from this time his house turned its attention increasingly south of the Alps. His desire to strengthen his position still further on the Italian side caused Henry to ally himself with Tuscany. The Pope pronounced a divorce between faithless Henry and his equally faithless Queen Margaret of Valois, thus enabling him to marry the Grand Duke's niece, Mary de' Medici. In 1601 was born a son and heir, afterwards Louis XIII. With the help of his friend and minister, Maximilien de Rosny, Duke of Sully, Henry thoroughly overhauled domestic affairs. Though entirely different in character, they worked together admirably. Henry's breadth of view tended to correct Sully's excessive economy and rather narrow and scrupulous attention to details. Henry was inventive, Sully was resourceful, and both were unwearied in well-doing for France. The financial question was one of supreme importance. The revenue was yearly swallowed up by the high interest due on a funded debt of over three hundred million pounds. Owing to a ruinous system of collection, three-quarters of the taxes never reached the treasury at all. The main sources of income were the tie, the gabelle, and the customs duties. In the Pays d'État, which were the five provinces most recently added to the monarchy and consisting of about one-third of France, the tie was levied on land by the local estates. As the estates of the church and the nobility were exempt, the amount raised while falling heavily on the lower classes, only realized a tenth instead of a third of the total taxation. The remaining two-thirds of France formed the Pays d'Election, those provinces which had for a considerable time belonged to the crown and where the tie was levied on income. There the taxes were farmed out from the intendant or financial agent downwards, and there was no check on the amount the officials would wring from the unhappy peasants. The most unpopular tax was the gabelle. Each French family was legally bound to buy an excessive quantity of inferior salt, which was a government monopoly. Lastly, there were the customs duties levied at the frontier of each province, discouraging trade between them. Not much help was to be gained from current economic principles, and Sully was not the man to supply new ones. His skill in money affairs fell as far short of genius as good account-keeping falls short of high finance. But he made innumerable small reforms in every department and sternly repressed abuses. He insisted on the local registers being kept with extreme exactness, so that the Chambre des Comptes might check abuses in the collection of the tie. He struck a blow at the host of greedy tax-gatherers by a decree forbidding any impost without the king's order registered in the Parliament. Noblemen and governors of districts might no longer raise money by credit. Usurped domain was recovered and well administered. The result of these and many small reforms were seen in Sully's report of 1609. One hundred millions of debt had been paid off. Nearly twenty-five millions had been gained from domain. The revenue had risen from about nine millions in 1596 to twenty millions, 
a reserve of thirty millions was laid by in the Bastille. Sully made no attempt to abolish the hateful gabelle, and he introduced another very questionable tax, the Paulette. This tax, one sixtieth of all official incomes, rendered the offices in question hereditary, and doubled their sale value. This system made a caste of the French official class, and one very burdensome to the country. The stronghold of hereditary office was in future the Parliament of Paris. Recognizing that France is by nature an agricultural country, Sully made a great point of tillage. He persuaded landowners to live upon and cultivate their sadly devastated estates. He protected the peasants from bandits. He remitted the tie between 1594 and 1596 and insisted on the free exportation of corn. From some prejudice against crafts as unfitting men for soldiers, Sully set his face against manufactures. But the king was bent on their encouragement. He ordered thousands of mulberry trees to be planted, and fostered the silk factories at Lyon, Nîmes, and Tours, the potteries at Nevers, and the glassworks at Paris. He planned a great canal system connecting the Seine, the Loire, the Saône, and the Meuse. He concluded commercial treaties with England and Holland, and renewed one already existing with Turkey. The beginnings of colonial policy were to be seen in the formation of the French East India Company and the foundation of Quebec by Champlain. Order was restored after the lawlessness of the civil wars by frequent executions for robbery and murder. An attempt was made to put down dueling by making offenders liable to the penalties of high treason. The rebellious or discontented nobles with whom their class interests stood first were humiliated one by one, and the aristocracy generally was reduced to the position of mere courtiers. Henry also did much for public works, built royal fortifications, and founded a school of engineering for his officers. Many of these measures aroused strong opposition, but the work of molding a state cannot be done with a lenient hand. Henry's frontier policy shows that the rivalry between France and Austria was active, and Sully's great design, a sort of political allegory, points in the same direction. An opening for the king's diplomacy appears in the Julier Cleves question in 1609, which in ordinary circumstances would hardly have attracted European attention. But these Catholic duchies lying south of the United Provinces seemed about to pass on the death of Duke John William to his Lutheran great-nephews, John Sigismund, Elector of Brandenburg, and Wolfgang William of Neuberg. As a Protestant ruler was certain by the principle cuius regio eius religio, to convert his territories to his own religion, the award of the duchies by the imperial courts was watched with the keenest interest by both Catholics and Protestants. The emperor's claim as their suzerain to occupy the duchies with an army pending the decision alarmed both French and Dutch, and Henry the Fourth at once set on foot a league for the protection of the Lutheran claimants, 1610. Three armies mustered by English, Dutch, German, and Savoyard troops made ready to invade the Pyrenees, Milan, and the disputed duchies, when the House of Habsburg was rescued from its most critical position by an unforeseen tragedy. As Henry the Fourth was driving through Paris one afternoon, his coach was blocked in a narrow thoroughfare. While the grooms cleared the way, one Ravaillac, who had followed the royal coach from the Louvre, mounted the footsteps and stabbed the king twice. Before his attendants realized what had happened, Henry the Fourth was dead, May fourteenth, sixteen ten. Ravaillac, a fanatic who probably harbored the idea that Henry was about to make war on Catholicism, made no attempt to escape and was astonished at the universal grief caused by the death of this soldier, statesman, and benefactor of his people. Without his practical genius to guide it, the war against Austria was abandoned, 
and the minority of Louis the Thirteenth, under the regency of his mother, Mary de Medici, sixteen ten to sixteen fourteen, threw back for fifteen years the development of Henry the Fourth's work. The Queen Mother was a foolish, mischief making, and overbearing woman who was entirely under the influence of an Italian lady in waiting, Leonora Galagai, and her husband Concini. The latter rose to the highest position as Marquis d'Ancre and Marshal of France, though he had never fired a shot in battle and was bitterly hated by the old nobility. Sully, the one man who might have been strong enough to guide the state, failed in courage and retired to Poitou. The only result of the great campaign against Austria was the capture of Juliet, after which the princes of Brandenburg and Neuberg remained in possession respectively of Cleves and Juliet, and the French withdrew from the war. The Queen Regent's own sympathies lay with Spain, and no time was lost in arranging a double marriage alliance between Louis the Thirteenth and the Infanta Anne, and the Princess Elizabeth of France with Philip the Third's heir. Sully's reserve treasure was squandered in buying the support of discontented nobles, who nevertheless demanded that their grievances against the feeble and expensive government should be laid before the States General. The assembly was accordingly summoned for the last time, as it turned out, before the French Revolution. Unluckily, they had no common purpose, but each estate, clergy, nobles, and commons, was occupied with its own special interest. On one subject only were they agreed, the shameful financial mismanagement of the Regency, and they succeeded in reducing pensions and in temporarily suspending the Paulette. The king, who came of age at fourteen, was encouraged by his favourite, de Luina, to resent the ascendancy of Dancre. Though himself a protégé of Dancre, de Luina had gained unexpected influence over the boy king by sharing his sporting tastes. A rising of the nobles confirmed their purpose to destroy Dancre, who, as he entered the Louvre, was shot by the guard on refusing to surrender his sword. His wife was burnt as a witch. The queen mother left the court for Blois, where Richelieu was carefully watching events and was finally the means of reconciling the king with his mother. Louis, with the title of constable, succeeded in place of Dancre, but his ministry was found to be no improvement upon his predecessors. A serious rising of the Huguenots soon occurred in 1620. The recent addition of Béarn to the monarchy by force of arms and the enforced restoration of church property there alarmed the Calvinists, who plotted to set up a southern republic. Louis the Thirteenth, who had a hereditary love of fighting, led the attack upon the Huguenot strongholds, Montpellier, Rochelle, Saint-Jean d'Angely, and finally Montauban, which resisted with heroic success under La Force. The death of Luynes from camp fever prepared the way for peace which was signed on the surrender of Montpellier. The Edict of Nantes was confirmed, but the guaranteed towns were reduced to two, Rochelle and Montauban. The privilege of holding political assemblies was entirely withdrawn. Meanwhile, Mary de' Medici had returned to court, and her confidential adviser, now Cardinal Richelieu, became chief minister of France, 1624. Armand du Plessis de Richelieu came of a noble Pontevin family and was now nearly forty. He had early left the military profession that he might hold the family bishopric of Luçon, whose responsibilities he undertook at twenty-four. Luçon was a quiet, even a dull home for a keen spirit, but Richelieu took an active interest in his diocese, besides intently watching political events and corresponding with his friends, among whom François du Tremblay, Le Père Joseph of history, was the most famous. By 1614, Richelieu was sufficiently notable to be chosen orator of the clergy in the States General, and his speech appears to have made the desired impression at court. 
he became almoner to the young Queen Anne, and soon won the confidence of the Queen Mother. In appearance, Richelieu was tall and spare, with a pale complexion, an aquiline nose, and piercing dark eyes under slightly raised eyebrows. He was restless and highly strung, but his courage, strength of will, and resource were extraordinary. He was ruthless and vindictive, and domineered over his family circle as he did over the state. On entering the ministry, Richelieu's objects, as he explained later, were three, namely, to destroy the political power of the Huguenots, to humiliate the great nobles, and to win prestige abroad for the king. The first shadow cast by coming events abroad was a dispute for the control of the Val Tallina, a valley connecting Tyrol with Lombardy. During a quarrel between the Catholic population of the district and their masters, the Swiss Grison League, the Spaniards in North Italy had supported the former, and a dreadful massacre of the Protestants had followed. The Spaniards at once sent a garrison to Coeur on the pretext of keeping order, but it was clear that their real object was the preservation of their communications with the empire. Richelieu was keenly alive to the importance of the question. For two centuries, France had been the recognized protector of the Guison, and this gave him the opportunity of opposing the Pope's arbitration as being too favorable to Spain, and of pouring troops into the valley, of which by 1625 they were in full possession. By the Treaty of Monzon, the Valtellina was restored to the Grison. Before Richelieu had disposed of the Valtellina, a Huguenot rising occurred at Rochelle, 1625. The time was well chosen. The cardinal's position at court was as yet insecure, and the attitude of England was becoming openly hostile. The expulsion from England of Henrietta's mischief-making ladies, Buckingham's peak at the cool reception of his proposal to visit the French court, his desire to win popularity at home by a successful naval expedition, these causes contributed to bring about what was really Buckingham's war. The English expedition landed on the Isle of Ray, facing the harbour of Rochelle. But Buckingham lost the chance of seizing its two badly defended forts and settled down to a blockade. To Richelieu, the reduction of Rochelle, that gate always open to the foreigner, was of vital importance. His early military training and his wonderful organising powers had full scope in directing the siege. He took pride in the excellent provision he made for his army. Prompt pay, warm clothing, abundance of food, and dry quarters to ward off malaria. Father Joseph and his Capuchins upheld the strict moral discipline of the camp, catechized the soldiers in their leisure, and pronounced absolution in the dangers of action. On the land side, Rochelle was infested by triple lines, and to cut off access to a friendly fleet, Richelieu caused a great stone barrier to be built from each end of the harbour. As these two moles approached each other, the space between was filled with sunken hulks and finely guarded by floating batteries. Rochelle, under its heroic mayor Guiton, held out valiantly amid the agonies of starvation, but the help of England, on which all depended, never reached it. Buckingham, who had been obliged to raise the blockade of Ray after Richelieu's revictualling of the garrison, was murdered at Portsmouth before his second expedition could start. And when the English squadron did arrive, it made no serious attempt to force the barrier. After eleven months' resistance, Rochelle surrendered. Richelieu showed moderation in his triumph. The fortifications were destroyed and the municipal privileges of the town abolished, but the lives and property of the citizens were spared, and they were promised freedom of worship. A simultaneous Huguenot rising in the south under Rouen was ended by the Peace of Alais, by which all independent political privileges and the last of the guaranteed towns were withdrawn. Henceforth, the Huguenots' only security for the promised liberty of conscience lay in the king's word. End 
of section 24. Section 25 of Europe in Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 11 The Ascendancy of France, Part 2. Thus ended, in the only way possible for her welfare, the religious wars in France. In the interests of national unity, Richelieu had separated the political and religious demands of the Huguenots, destroying the first and securing the second. For among the political aims, that of independence, aided by foreign enemies of France, had for the last fifteen years been steadily coming to the front. The Huguenots, it was said, preferred a Spaniard to a French Catholic, while if they proclaimed a fast, it was in order to mask some plot on foot against the government. Before this, Richelieu's first great object had been completely achieved. Foreign affairs again claimed his attention. On the death of the childless Duke of Mantua and Montferrat in 1627, the duchy was claimed by his next of kin, the Duke of Nevers, a French subject, and by numerous candidates supported by Spain. The emperor undertook to arbitrate, but imperial activity was not welcome in Italy, and Milan and Savoy on their own account occupied Montferrat, and with Spanish troops under Spinola besieged Casale, into which a French garrison had been thrown. Ferdinand II, indignant at this slight upon his authority, at the first opportunity in the Thirty Years' War, sent troops into Mantua. Richelieu set out in person for the scene of action in command of three French marshals and a formidable expedition, which was, however, diverted into Savoy on account of the Duke's double-faced policy. But the capture of the fortress of Pinerolo was their only success, and France was glad of the opening afforded by Spinola's death to make a truce. Though French military intervention had not been very effective, there remained the indirect methods of diplomacy. It was possible to hamper the House of Habsburg at home, and this Richelieu did in two ways. By negotiating a peace between Sweden and Poland, he opened the way into the Thirty Years' War for Gustavus Adolphus. And at the Diet of Ratisbon, Father Joseph played an important part in securing Wallenstein's dismissal and in frustrating the election of the Archduke Ferdinand as King of the Romans. By the Treaty of Ratisbon, the Emperor promised to invest the new French Duke of Mantua, after which event all foreign powers were to clear out of territories recently occupied by them. Richelieu was bent on keeping Pinerolo, and actually disavowed the treaty to which Father Joseph had been a party. The probable explanation of this move will be seen in domestic affairs. The new Duke of Mantua was finally installed by the Treaty of Carrasco, but France forced him to sell a large part of Montferrat to Savoy, in order to compensate the latter for the loss of Pinerolo. For France in the end secured her key to the passage of the Alps. It is probable that the peace, had it come earlier, would have made Richelieu no longer indispensable, hence his rejection of the first terms. There was always a danger that the constant pressure exerted against him by the two queens, his enemies, might take sudden effect. Louis, though moody and uncertain, was very far from being a negligible quantity in politics. While he depended on Richelieu's advice, even in small private matters, he almost unconsciously resented his ascendancy. He was almost incapable of attachment to anyone, and the only road to his favor was success. Yet even success might be too dearly bought at the price of domestic peace. Before the Italian question was at an end, a plot for Richelieu's arrest was on foot under the patronage of both queens and the king's worthless brother, Gaston of Orléans and supported by the Chancellor and his brother Marshal Mariac. Mary de' Medici brought matters to a point 
by a violent attack on Richelieu in the king's presence, challenging her son to choose between his mother and his minister. Louis, who was greatly annoyed, hesitated some hours, and the court considered Richelieu a doomed man. Then the king left for Versailles and sent for Richelieu to join him. The sudden reaction that followed has made November 11th, 1630, famous as the Day of Dupes. The Queen Mother's influence was shattered, and in the spring she escaped to Spanish protection in Brussels. Gaston fled to Lorraine, the Chancellor was driven into exile, and the Marshal executed after an arbitrary trial. In following his second great aim, the humiliation of the nobles, Richelieu made only one exception to his rule of always bringing the most powerful offender to justice. The exception was the king's brother Gaston, whose contemptible character prevented his becoming a dangerous force in France. But he was constantly the cause of bringing others into trouble. Thus, after the day of dupes, the support lent to him by the Duke of Lorraine was the means of bringing that country under French occupation, while his confederate Montmorency, though the last of an illustrious family, perished on the scaffold. Yet Gaston's name is again found among the conspirators, saint mars Ditou, and Bouillon, who tried for the last time to overthrow Richelieu. The cardinal, as he lay apparently dying, revived to bring saint mars the king's favorite equerry and his less guilty friend de Thou, to execution. Exhausted by this final victory, Richelieu passed away, December 4th, 1642, declaring that he had had no other aims than the welfare of God and of the state. The list of great nobles who suffered death at Richelieu's hands for political reasons included five dukes, four counts, a French marshal, and the king's chief equerry. But the humiliation of their class was achieved by edicts against dueling, the building of castles and of fortresses, though it is possible that change of fashion was at work in the same direction. As the real organizer of the professional army of France, he took the opportunity to suppress the offices of constable and admiral, and raised many infantry regiments without the customary agency of the nobles. For the navy, which scarcely existed in 1624, he did even more, leaving at his death a fleet of 56 warships. Most important, however, of all his measures to reduce the nobles was the superseding of all but four of the 19 great territorial magnates by royal officials. This permanent class of intendants, created by Richelieu, was responsible in each district to the crown alone for the local administration of finance, justice, and police. The suppression of feudalism was inevitably the first step toward the unity of France under a powerful crown, and as the French nobles had accustomed themselves to enjoy privileges without corresponding duties, it is impossible to regret the fate which overtook this least useful and most troublesome class of society. The third of Richelieu's great objects will be dealt with in connection with the Thirty Years' War. His great claim to his country's gratitude is that he gave her unity. Except through the power of the crown, this end was probably unattainable, and Richelieu therefore made the king the source and center of national life. His idea of royalty was absolute monarchy. It is useless to discuss, in view of his opinion and circumstances, whether he should or could have given France a constitutional government. The question is rather whether the despotism he bequeathed to his country was benevolent at all. It is not easy to defend Richelieu from the charge of sweeping away traditional rights merely to unfetter the action of the crown. The effect was certainly to encourage contempt for law and custom. For instance, the Parliament of Paris, in its proper court, was thoroughly able to deal with political prisoners. Yet the Cardinal invariably appointed a special commission to try offenders. Again, 
the provincial estates belonging to the pays d'etat may not have been either fully representative or very useful still they stood for local opinion which was stifled in certain provinces by the introduction of elu or royal officials the whole system of local government by the intendants was unknown to the law though they took precedence of all the district officials if any man could have wrestled successfully with the abuses of privilege that man was richelieu most powerful of french ministers yet though his hand was heavy upon the nobles he left them in full possession of the seigneurial rights that burdened the peasant's lot under his rule taxation had increased fourfold yet the nobles the clergy and the official class continued to be exempt all the old bad taxes and abuses since sully's time remained he neglected the agricultural interest which has always been the chief source of the country's wealth and at his death the revenue for the next three years was already spent there is no doubt he could have been better served had he chosen than by the financial agents he employed and his habit of directing important campaigns himself may partly account for the absence of first-class military talent under his rule as a spiritual force in the religious life of his time he counted for little he regarded the church as a useful moral influence and as the best training school for the highest branches of public service he did something to reform the religious orders and seems to have thought of making himself independent patriarch of france since all his attempts failed to win papal favor his successor cardinal mazarin far less commanding in personality and less original in statesmanship only continued part of his work the campaign against austria giulio mazzarini chief minister sixteen forty two to sixteen sixty one born in italy in sixteen o two and educated at rome and in spain had like richelieu forsaken a soldier's career for diplomacy for two years he acted as papal nuncio in paris and became a naturalized frenchman he succeeded father joseph in richelieu's confidence became cardinal in sixteen forty one and was commended by his dying master to the king as louis the thirteenth's own health was fast failing and the dauphin only four years old mazarin foresaw the coming importance of the queen and by his personal attractions and deferential manners won her favour anne was lonely and unappreciated after her husband's death in sixteen forty three she responded by giving mazarin her entire confidence and affection and it is probable that they were secretly married it was through his influence that the queen was recognized by the parliament as regent with full sovereign powers instead of sharing them with the rest of the council as louis the thirteenth had intended during his son's minority though mazarin was heir to richelieu's ideas nothing could have been more different than their methods no changes took place among the officials but the return of many exiles ushered in milder rule mazarin was unlike richelieu neither vindictive nor jealous of other able men the discovery of two soldiers of the first rank at the outset of his ministry was hardly accidental mazarin always avoided frontal attacks he was patient adroit and full of dissimulation to win a point he could fawn and cringe and his manner was one of confiding innocence these qualities his foreign origin and his great avarice jointly account for the exceeding hatred he inspired in france even in her neglected days anne of austria had not been without her own circle and these queen's friends styled les importants aimed at ousting the cardinal with the result that their leader beaufort was imprisoned and their party broken up a much stronger expression of feeling against mazarin appeared in the movement known as the fronde sixteen forty eight to sixteen fifty three called after the sling which was the typical weapon of the paris gamin except in gaining a brief breathing space for spain at a critical period of the war the fronde forms no part of european history and will only be sketched here in outline 
Its causes may be summed up as hatred of Mazarin, reaction against Richelieu's lawless absolutism, ambition on the part of the nobles to recover lost ground. The First Fronde was also a constitutional movement, partly inspired by the example of the English Civil War. The second, an undisguised struggle between the king and the nobles. The first movement centred round a programme of reform drawn up by the Parliament of Paris and containing two demands of vital interest for the future, the control of taxation by the Parliament and of arbitrary imprisonment by means of a habeas corpus act. The court party foolishly seized the leaders of the agitation, whereupon ensued a tremendous uproar, street barricades, and the usual signs of a Paris mob's displeasure. The court gave way and the demands were registered. It is not greatly to the point to criticize the unfitness of the Parliament to carry out constitutional reform. It was surely a step forward to control by whatever existing institutions the government's arbitrary power to tax and imprison. Unfortunately, however, the Parliament proved too weak and the nobles too selfish to carry reform. The nobles who led the second movement, though the famous Condé was of their number, were mere holiday warriors or great ladies who lent their spasmodic interest and fascinating wiles to politics. The arrest of Condé and his nearest kinsmen exposed Mazarin to the full force of the storm. He fled to Cologne, whence he continued to direct French affairs. He was declared an exile, and his library and art treasures were sold by order of the Parliament. Eight months of civil war followed. Finally, the prestige of the crown proved too strong for its enemies. The valuable services of Turenne, Condé's unpopularity in Paris, the disorganization of trade and the general distress of the plundered kingdom were all factors in the defeat of the Fronde. Mazarin was recalled to undisputed supremacy. Condé took service under the Spanish government, and other leaders were exiled or excluded from power. The nobles were permanently reduced, and the parliament forbidden to meddle in state affairs. The remaining seven years of Mazarin's ministry were occupied by the conclusion of the war with Spain, which will be noticed in the next chapter, and in the accumulation of a fortune of thirty millions. His interests were less varied than Richelieu's, but he was a generous friend to men of letters. He did nothing for the financial disorders of France, but in the management of his own prosperous affairs he trained Colbert, a great financier, whom on his death in 1661 he bequeathed to the king's service with the advice that Louis should be his own chief minister. End of section 25section twenty six of europe and renaissance and reformation by mary a hollings this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter twelve the thirty years war part one in tracing the causes of the thirty years war three important changes in the condition of germany since the peace of augsburg must be noticed first there is the growth of princely power due chiefly to the seizure in Protestant states of church lands and to the increase of the ruler's authority since Charles V, especially during the reigns of Maximilian II and Rudolf II. Secondly, the Reformation, which by 1555 had invaded the greater part of both North and South Germany, reached its high-water mark and was already on the ebb the weaknesses of protestantism began to appear its want of organization the ignorance and pitiable poverty of the pastors the quarrels about definition of the faith though unrecognized by the peace of augsburg calvinism was spreading and an impassable gulf divided its followers from the lutherans the enmity between the electors palatine twice calvinist and twice lutheran in sixty years and the Lutheran electors of Saxony was one of the chief drawbacks to the cause of Protestantism. The appropriation by Protestant princes of church lands in their dominions provoked 
unceasing protests from Catholics, while the ecclesiastical reservation was continually evaded when a chapter that had become Protestant elected a bishop of its own views. In this way, eight important North German bishoprics passed into their hands. Thirdly, the progress of the Catholic or Counter-Reformation brought the opposing forces up to fighting point. Before 1600, the Protestant advance had been stayed. England, Holland, and Scandinavia were its undisputed conquests. But in once ultra-Protestant Poland, Catholicism was restored in 1587, in the Spanish Netherlands by 1579, and recognized as the state religion of France in 1598. In Spain and Italy, it had no rival. In Germany itself, Bavaria had become by 1579 an active center of Jesuit influence, and in 1596, Styria, Carinthia, and Carniola passed under a fanatical ruler, Ferdinand, cousin of Rudolf II, who obliged his subjects to bow to Catholicism. Rudolf followed suit in Austria, Bohemia, and Moravia, and by forsaking the tolerant position of Ferdinand I and Maximilian II, he laid the match to the train. Rudolf II, 1576-1612, to 1612, a bigoted, art-loving, and unbalanced recluse, was probably by 1594 quite insane. Yet he continued to reign seventeen years longer. At last, a Habsburg family council appointed his next brother Matthias to rule Hungary and Austria in the hope of saving the eastern frontier from the Turks and of soothing religious discord by a tardy promise of toleration. The anxious fears of the Protestants had been aroused the year before by the enforced restoration of Catholicism at Donauwurt, on the pretext afforded by a riot during a religious procession. The Protestant princes and cities of the South at once united in the Protestant Union under the leadership of the Calvinist Christian of Anhalt, a hopeful and impetuous spirit fatally prone to despise the enemy's strength. The Catholic League, a rival association led by Maximilian of Bavaria, was immediately started by the three ecclesiastical electors. The Julier Cleves question all but kindled war, which was, however, delayed by the death of Henry IV, the dread of a crisis, and the pacific influence of the Lutheran princes. Of these, the chief was John George of Saxony, doubly opposed to Christian of Anhalt, on account of his own Lutheran and imperialist sympathies, and lacking the necessary decision and strength of a leader. In Maximilian of Bavaria, the Catholics were more fortunate, for the Duke, who had been educated at the Jesuit College of Ingolstadt, was both resolute and moderate, and an able and practical ruler of his state. The Bohemian Protestants, encouraged by the successes of their Hungarian brethren, wrung from Rudolf II a royal charter, Majestatsbrief, granting complete toleration on royal domains and freedom of conscience elsewhere. Amid the strife following this enactment, Rudolf was succeeded by Matthias, 1612 to 1619, during whose reign came the proverbial lull before the storm. Being worn out and childless, Matthias desired to secure the succession of his cousin Ferdinand of Styria, who had an heir, and might be trusted to keep together the Habsburg dominions. In the family possessions this was easy, and by adroit management the elective crowns of Bohemia and Hungary were also promised to Ferdinand. Suddenly, however, the Protestant nobles of Bohemia, headed by Count Thurn, awoke to the reality of their danger, and having vainly appealed to Matthias, sent an armed deputation to Prague. They entered the castle, and charging the two unpopular and fanatical regents, Martinets and Slavada, with responsibility for the emperor's attitude, they flung the hapless men with their secretary for company into the fosse some seventy feet below. Though not one of them was seriously injured, this violent deed proved the beginning of the Bohemian Revolution, 
1619 to 1623. But neither at home nor abroad were any declared allies. The Bohemian nobles were half hearted and as reluctant as the towns to bear the cost of an army, and Ferdinand would have made short work of the Bohemian resistance had it not been for the energy of Christian of Anhalt and the support of his young friend, Frederick V, Elector Palatine. It was assumed that James I of England, the Elector's father in law, would lend his aid, though he was known to be a man of peace and warmly disposed towards Spain. Troops under Count Mansfeld, first of the many adventurers who shouldered their way through the war, reduced Ferdinand's forces to their last fortress in Bohemia, and the storm had just burst when, on the death of Matthias, Ferdinand II succeeded to the helm of state, 1619 to 1637. He was a man of upright life, narrow sympathies, and resolute character, who, without the grasp of a statesman, was yet able to take a firmer hold of affairs than either of the last two kings. Immediately Ferdinand was surrounded in Vienna by Protestant troops under Turn, to whom the Austrian nobles threatened to open the gates unless they were allowed to unite with the Bohemians. The firmer the king, the more insolent grew the deputation, till the sound of cavalry galloping up announced that the siege of Vienna was raised and that Ferdinand was free to pursue his election at Frankfurt. Thanks to the disunion among the Protestant leaders, he was unanimously chosen emperor. Exactly two days earlier, the Bohemians, having already deposed Ferdinand, invited the elector of the Palatinate to be their king. Frederick, a rigid Calvinist, was inexperienced and easily led, especially by his hero Christian of Anhalt. The transfer of Bohemia to a Protestant would definitely incline the balance of German religious parties to that side, and all Europe intently awaited the event. Christian's influence prevailed, and Frederick was crowned at Prague. Unfortunately, he had reckoned without his host, for none of his possible allies, England, Holland, or the German Protestant Union, were at all prepared to act. The last, indeed, only undertook the defense of the Palatinate, while the Calvinist zealot, Bethlen Gabor, on whom hopes had been formed, secured Transylvania as his principality by temporarily coming to terms with Ferdinand. On the other hand, the Emperor's allies, Spain, Poland, Tuscany, and the Catholic League, were ready for deeds. Spinola and his Spaniards descended upon the Palatinate, Tilly of Alun, who had served under Parma, occupied the duchies of Austria with the army of the League, and drove the enemy before him under the walls of Prague. We are just outside the town, on the White Hill, Christian of Anhalt's forces awaited events. Tilly attacked promptly, and in an hour the Battle of the White Hill was won. Frederick, who was lunching inside the city with some English envoys, only reached the field in time to be swept away by his own fugitive troops. Only a winter king, as the Jesuits had foreseen, he escaped with his family to the Netherlands. In Bohemia, the Protestant movement was pitilessly crushed. Ferdinand tore up the Maya State's brief, executed the leading nobles, planted foreign soldiery on the confiscated lands, and set the Jesuits to convert by persecution. Many Protestants left the country with disastrous results to its progress. The Protestant Union was dissolved in 1621, and its disbanded forces enlisted under Mansfeld, who, having been driven from the upper palatinate by Spinola, betook himself to the Rhineland and roused Christian of Brunswick, one of the new Protestant bishops, and the Margrave of Baden-Durlach, to adopt the cause of the fair Queen of Bohemia. But both were defeated by Tilly before Mansfeld could come to the rescue. The upper palatinate with its capital, Heidelberg, fell into Tilly's hands and was made over to the administration of Maximilian of Bavaria with the title of Elector Palatine for life. Frederick, now a landless exile, was obliged to dismiss his army whose leaders, Mansfeld and Christian of Brunswick, 
lived by pillage in Alsace and Lorraine. Thus closed the first or Bohemian period of the Thirty Years' War. Unfortunately, Ferdinand did not use this opportunity to come to terms with the Elector Palatine, and the control of the fortunes of the war soon passed into other hands. Protestant North Germany was becoming thoroughly alarmed for the safety of its church lands, which seemed to run an equal risk of being confiscated by the emperor and being pillaged by Mansfeld, who had quartered himself in East Friesland. Since the marriage treaty between England and Spain had failed with the Prince of Wales's Madrid visit, Parliament was urging James to form an armed alliance for the recovery of the Palatinate. The result was the betrothal of Charles to Henrietta Maria of France and the declaration of war between England and Spain. It was at this moment that Richelieu had become first minister of France, and by disputing the Spanish occupation of the Valtellina and pressing Mansfeld into the service of the Dutch, he opened his campaign against the Habsburgs and added politics to religion as a cause of the Thirty Years' War. While the siege of Rochelle occupied his attention, England had come to an understanding with Christian IV of Denmark, who was keenly interested in the independence of the Lower Saxon bishoprics, and in return for English subsidies entered upon the Second or Danish period of the war, 1625 to 1629. In the face of this triple alliance of English, Danish, and North German forces, the emperor's position was very critical, when suddenly from Bohemia itself sprang his champion, Wallenstein. Born in 1583 of an old Bohemian family, Albert of Wallenstein had already, as a daring and lucky agent of the Catholic Reformation, carved out from Bohemian confiscations the almost regal estates of the Duke of Friedland. He now proposed to raise an imperial force to be supported by compulsory contributions. It soon numbered 50,000 men. This regularly paid and disciplined army, where Catholic and Protestant were alike welcome, and promotion was decided by merit alone, was a strange contrast to the rabble that had hitherto done duty as such, without uniform, without pay, and cruel beyond belief in its license to plunder. In strategical and tactical ability, Wallenstein ranks next to Gustavus Adolphus in the war, while his courage, justice, and consideration for his men gathered recruits from every quarter. But it was a dangerous precedent for the emperor to depend upon troops enrolled by an independent leader and paid by a system unknown to the law. Serious hostilities began at the bridge of Dessau by Wallenstein's utter defeat of Mansfeld, who had hoped first to join hands with Betlen Gabor. Instead, he was obliged to disband his forces, and while struggling through Bosnia to Venice, he died. Christian of Brunswick had already passed away, but Christian IV, preparing to join his allies in Bohemia, was outnumbered by combined forces of Tilly and Wallenstein, who defeated him with overwhelming loss of officers, men, and guns at Luda. North Germany was left at the mercy of the Catholic League. Brandenburg was prevailed upon to declare for Ferdinand, and Wallenstein and Tilly invaded Schleswig-Holstein, driving Christian before them to the islands of Denmark. There Wallenstein realized the crowning importance of control of the sea, and though he could not persuade the Hansa towns to lend him their ships, he overran the twin duchies of Mecklenburg and demanded that certain Baltic ports should admit imperial garrisons. Among these, Stralsund stoutly refused. As Wallenstein, though general of the Oceanic and Baltic Sea, was without a fleet, Stralsund was accessible to help from Sweden and Denmark, and its burghers preferred to accept foreign aid rather than to submit to persecution and military despotism. At the end of five months, Wallenstein, to his intense mortification, was obliged to turn his back on Stralsund. Peace was at last in sight. Christian's weariness of the war, 
Wallenstein's suspicions of Sweden, the German prince's suspicions of Wallenstein, prepared the way for the Peace of Lübeck, 1629, by which the King of Denmark recovered Jutland, Schleswig, and his Holstein possessions on undertaking to renounce all claims to the German bishoprics held by his family. The Catholic League was determined, however jealous it might feel of Wallenstein's victories, to turn them to account in the service of religion. They prevailed on Ferdinand to issue the Edict of Restitution, restoring to the Church all property that had been secularized since 1552. Two archbishoprics, twelve bishoprics, and more than a hundred monasteries were about to be torn from the Protestants, whose opposition in the face of the huge armies of Tilly and Wallenstein was unavailing. The edict was, however, entirely contrary to the principle of religious equality on which Wallenstein's army was based, and to his patriotic ideal of regenerating Germany by maintaining an armed neutrality between the creeds. He looked to establish a strong emperor upon the ruins of the princely power that he despised, to lead a crusade against the Turks to ask in return it might even be a crown for himself. But Ferdinand was undecided, and the princes, rather than lose their independence, were ready, like the Stralsund burghers, to call in foreign aid. This divergence of aims between the League and the Emperor's general gave Richelieu his opportunity of dealing a blow at the Habsburgs, and Gustavus Adolphus an opening for his entry into German politics of which both took advantage. At the Diet of Ratisbon, Father Joseph, one of the best informed, most penetrating, and supple diplomatists of his time, succeeded in turning the scales against Ferdinand's general. Strange to say, Wallenstein, the master of legions, accepted his dismissal, and retired into private life on his Bohemian estates, while Tilly succeeded to his command. The next problem for the princes was to discover the intentions of the King of Sweden, and here the history of the House of Vasa must be briefly sketched. End of section 26. Section 27 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12. The Thirty Years' War, Part 2. Between 1397 and 1523, the three kingdoms of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden were united under one crown by the Union of Kalmar. No real national feeling existed, however, and the work of the House of Vasa was to win for Sweden her independence of the predominant partner, Denmark. In avenging the fate of many of his fellow nobles in the Stockholm bloodbath, Gustavus Eriksson accomplished this task and was crowned King of Sweden in 1523. His family took the name Vasa from the sheaf in their coat of arms. It was the aim of Gustavus to build up a strong monarchy under which the power of the church and of the nobles should be leveled, the disorders of the country suppressed, and its internal wealth and foreign influence developed. As in England, the king made use of the Reformation to strengthen the crown. By the famous recess of the Diet of Vesteras, the adoption of Lutheranism not only gave the king the support of the clergy, whom he appointed, but confiscated the church lands for his benefit. In 1544, at a later diet of the same name, the throne was made hereditary, whereby a serious blow was dealt at the independence of the nobles. The foreign policy of Sweden as a European power, though indicated by Gustavus Vasa, remained for his successors Eric and John to develop. It inevitably roused the rivalry of other northern nations with like interests, namely Denmark and Russia, and under John's son, Sigismund III, the restorer of Roman Catholicism in Poland, a determined effort was made on his election to the throne for the recovery of Sweden to the Church. The Swedes, however, resented foreign interference with their religion, and in 1593 the Synod of Uppsala 
formally accepted the confession of Augsburg. Sigismund soon retired to Poland, and was scarcely more than King of Sweden in name until his deposition in 1599. The real ruler afterwards, Charles IX, was the ablest of Gustavus Vasa's sons, who was a strong champion of Protestantism and the founder of Sweden's forward policy in the Baltic, a policy that brought him into collision with both Poland and Denmark. He made good his hold on Livonia and Estonia, but his death at the outbreak of the Danish war left its burden on the broad young shoulders of his son. Though Gustavus Adolphus, 1611 to 1632, was only 17, his public life had begun at nine, and he was already well trained in war and politics. He could speak seven languages, had a Protestant's love and knowledge of his Bible, and cared for poetry and music. In appearance he was a typical Northman, tall, fair, and blue-eyed, and he inherited the characteristics of his race, their ambition, versatility, fiery temper, and joy in battle. But with these qualities, Gustavus united a noble and generous nature and a sound judgment which guided his pursuit of the ideals that lay near his heart. It is the union in Gustavus of the imaginative and the practical that makes him the most attractive figure of his age. For the first eighteen years of his reign, Gustavus was at war in turn with Denmark, Russia, and Poland. For the second, he gained the provinces of Ingria and Karelia, closing her access to the sea. From the third, he conquered Livonia and a long line of Prussian coast, with the right of levying customs at the ports, which enabled him to pay his way at the outset of the Thirty Years' War. Almost more valuable was the thorough military training his troops received in these campaigns. On his landing in Germany, fully half his army of 70,000 Scots, Poles, Germans, and Swedes consisted of his own subjects, a great achievement for a population numbering under two million. The Third or Swedish Period of the War, 1630 to 1635, opens with Gustavus's landing in Pomerania. He joined the struggle at his own time and for his own reasons. He fought because he believed the Swedish nationality and the Protestant religion to be at stake, because Protestantism was bound up with the past and future of his house and of his kingdom, and because he believed that the Habsburg designs on the Sound and the Baltic would stifle Swedish national life in its cradle. The undertaking was doubly uncertain from the condition of his allies. Denmark, latently jealous, England, preoccupied at home, the Dutch, lukewarm, the German princes, except Bernard of Saxe Weimar aloof, the two important electors of Saxony and Brandenburg remaining stolidly neutral. With France, he was only able to come to terms when Richelieu realized that Sweden was not to be exploited in the interests of his own or any other country. The cardinal's first reason for entering the war was to secure the frontiers of France. Before long, everything opposed to German unity appeared to be a direct gain to French interests, and finally his policy stopped at nothing short of annexation. His calculations were disturbed by the presence of Gustavus as of a new planet, that swam into his ken. The reserve, the sturdy independence, and the Lutheran sympathies of the king interfered with the true course of the cardinal's policy to hold the balance between the Catholic League and the Protestant Union, and to avoid a declaration of war until its profits could be secured. Yet it was impossible at the same time to be a supporter of the loyalist Maximilian of Bavaria and an open enemy of the emperor or to direct the Catholic policy of Europe, while undermining the Habsburg power through Protestant allies. As long as the genius of Gustavus threw the balance of success on the Protestant side, Richelieu must perforce protect the Catholics. The death of Gustavus obliged him to devote himself to the task of saving the Protestant alliance. Thus, the religious character of the war was slowly merged among national interests for whose sake Germany gradually rallied round her emperor against the foes of his house. 
By the Treaty of Barwalde, France and Sweden agreed to defend the freedom of the Baltic and of the open sea, to restore the liberties of the German states, to observe neutrality toward the League, and to respect the liberty of Catholic worship in conquered districts. Tilly, commanding the armies of both Empire and League, failed to divide Gustavus and Pomerania from Horn in Mecklenburg, and was driven by them back upon the Elbe. The Swedes stormed Frankfurt and secured the line of the Oda. Urgent appeals for help reached them from Magdeburg, a Protestant stronghold near the Brandenburg boundary of Saxony, which was besieged by the imperialists under Pappenheim. Gustavus judged that the town could hold out two months longer, and he hoped to avoid risking the hostility of the electors of Brandenburg and Saxony through crossing their territory to rescue Magdeburg by first securing their act of alliance. But the electors were slow and obstinate, and though the deliverance of Magdeburg was a supreme necessity, Gustavus, who was not wont to stand upon the letter of the law, hesitated, and Magdeburg fell. Twenty thousand men, women, and children were slaughtered, and the whole town except the cathedral and a few houses on the outskirts was burnt to the ground. Tilly then invaded Saxony, and the electors were driven by the force of circumstances to declare for Sweden. The armies of Gustavus and John George of Saxony came up with Tilly on the Breitenfeld in the famous battle plain of Leipzig, September 1631. Tilly's long line of solid squares confronted a double line of the Swedes in a loose formation of smaller squares, which have been compared to little movable fortresses, and which were interspersed with cavalry. Though the Saxons fled headlong with their elector, the superior artillery of the Swedes and their greater mobility won the day. Tilly's Walloon veterans made a last stand round their old leader, and bore him wounded from the field. The imperialists, as a fighting force, had been wiped out. Their guns, standards, and camp spoils fell into the enemy's hands. Tilly retreated to the Weser to gather up his fragments. The whole of North Germany was won for the Protestant cause. The Catholic territories now lay open to attack, and disregarding Richelieu's advice to make for Austria, Gustavus took the road known as the Priest's Lane through Franconia to the ecclesiastical states. He rightly judged that even the capture of Vienna, not then a national capital, would assure his position less than a march of deliverance among the South German Protestants. Great plans were shaping in his mind to destroy what was left of the imperial forces, to weld the Protestants into a general alliance, a corpus of Angelicorum, under himself as a member of the empire, possibly even as emperor. Through the Thuringian forest, Gustavus marched victoriously by Würzburg down the Main, annexing Franconia, and threatening to treat the neutrality of the three Rhine electors as equivalent to hostility. They appealed to France, and Richelieu's jealousy of Sweden's influence on the Rhine prompted the demand that all Gustavus' conquests, except in Treves and Cologne, should be restored. Even to these exceptions, however, Bavaria refused to agree, so Maximilian renounced the French alliance and openly joined the emperor. With the loss of its leader, the League ceased to exist. While Bernard of Weimar conquered the Palatinate, removing every obstacle to the elector Frederick's restoration except the latter's invincible objection to his Lutheran subjects, Gustavus had captured Frankfurt and Mainz and was preparing to advance into Bavaria, where Tilly had reinforced himself and had united with Maximilian. Meeting with an enthusiastic welcome at Nuremberg on his way, the king crossed the Danube and confronted Tilly, who had successfully entrenched himself on the Lech, 1632. As the bridges had been destroyed, Gustavus threw pontoons across the stream in the night, and for six hours engaged Tilly's troops in a furious cannonade. The old general was mortally wounded in the thigh, and under cover of night, Maximilian carried him and his forces off to Ingolstadt, where he died. At Ingolstadt the king met his first repulse, 
but he quickly overran Bavaria and made ready at last to carry the war into the emperor's own territories. No escape for Ferdinand seemed possible when Germany suddenly rang with the news of Wallenstein's return to his old master, April 1632. But his terms were his own, absolute control of his army, toleration as the basis of peace, expulsion of the foreigner, and a principality, possibly an electorate, as his reward. The magic of Wallenstein's name soon gathered round him soldiers of fortune of every nation, rank, and religious belief, who were only to be restrained by the severest discipline. Of the Saxon army which was occupying Bohemia he made short work, and plundering Saxony as he went, he marched south to join the Bavarian forces. Well aware of the uncertain nature of John George's alliance, Gustavus was on the point of hastening to his rescue when the news of Wallenstein's approach turned him southwards to defend his staunch ally, Nuremberg. Round the city he gradually concentrated his reinforcements under Oxenstierna, Bernard, Banner, and Hesse, till they finally numbered about four-fifths of Wallenstein's huge army. On the hills north of the town, opposite the main Swedish position, Wallenstein fortified his camp, resolving to risk no engagement without manifest superiority, but to isolate and starve out Gustavus. Famine and pestilence and summer heat wrought even more deadly havoc in the overcrowded town than in both camps, although their total death roll exceeded that of any great battle in the war. With starvation staring them in the face, the discipline of the soldiers began to break down. After a desperate night attack on Wallenstein's position, the king withdrew. Wallenstein directed his march on Saxony, intending to terrorize the elector into alliance, but in his own words, the Swedes came as if they had flown and concentrated at Erfurt. Convinced that the bitter cold of those first November days would drive Gustavus into winter quarters, Wallenstein fortified his position at Lützen, and detached Pappenheim for service at Cologne, when the amazing news arrived of the enemy's advance. Hastily recalling Pappenheim, Wallenstein hurried his regiments into position. At nightfall, November 16, 1632, the two armies divided by the Leipzig road were drawn up on the plain of Lützen, and at daybreak a thick mist hung over the field. The formation of Breitenfeld seems to have been repeated, the Swedes in two lines opposed to one of the imperialists. The king, without armor, on his white charger commanding the cavalry on the right wing. Bernard on the left, the infantry and the big guns massed in the center. Under cover of an artillery duel, the Swedes advanced to the high road, and from that moment charge followed charge all along the line. The Swedes seized the guns in an attack on the imperialist center, but were instantly repulsed, and with terrible loss of life among their officers, the guns were recaptured. Gustavus, galloping to the rescue at the head of his picked cavalry, rode into a patch of mist and lost touch with the main body. A party of cuirassiers discovered him wounded and tended by one faithful page. I am the king of Sweden. Gustavus answered to their challenge. They thrust him through with their swords, and the page beside him plundered the dead bodies and rode off. The white charger carried the fatal news in his frantic rush riderless along the lines. Bernard took command, and wild for vengeance, the Swedes flung themselves upon the enemy. They recovered the king's body, retook the imperialist guns, and though temporarily forced back by the arrival of Pappenheim's troopers, gripped their footing at the high road, and in a last charge drove the imperialist army from the field. But though victory was with the Swedes, it was dearly bought in a heavy death roll, and above all, in the supreme loss of the king, general, and statesman whose place no other man could fill. His chancellor and friend Oxenstierna took up his political work and guided the minority of Gustavus's six-year-old daughter, Queen Christina. Bernard and Horn alternated in command of the army. But France and the majority of German Protestants 
felt genuinely relieved at the king's death, because France had never been able to control him, and the Germans found him a stronger master than their emperor. Yet Richelieu's eagerness to enlarge French frontiers was checked by the immediate danger of the collapse of the Swedish power. So he supplied money and encouragement, and allied himself with the new league of Heilbronn, the nearest realization of Gustavus's corpus evangelicorum. It was a defensive and offensive union of circles, Franconian, Schwabian, and Rhenish with Sweden. The elector of Saxony held aloof. He was in fact negotiating with Wallenstein, who had withdrawn to Bohemia after Lützen, and with whose name rumor was busy. The advance of Bernard and Horn in the Danube Valley was attributed by the Bavarians to his indifference. His many enemies joined in the general chorus of suspicion and gained the imperial ear. Even now his aims are hardly understood, but his chief desire seems to have been the restoration of peace, mainly through turning Richelieu's ambitions in the direction of the Low Countries. Yet Ferdinand was bent on cooperation with Bavaria and Spain, and if Wallenstein's peace meant large concessions to Protestantism, he must expect to break with the court. His reliance on his army received its first shock in the desertion of some of his leading generals. Next he was declared guilty of treason, dismissed from all command, and his soldiers were released from their allegiance. Finally, before he could rally other supporters round him at Eger, his most faithful officers were lured by the governor of the fortress to a banquet and there assassinated. Devereux, an Irish captain, sought out Wallenstein's quarters, and with a following of soldiers, murdered him as he was turning in for the night, February 1634. End of section 27. Section 28 of Europe and Renaissance and Reformation by Mary A. Hollings. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 12. The Thirty Years' War, Part 3. Though not the noblest figure of the war, Wallenstein is in some ways the most interesting. With all his faults, he desired to serve Germany, and would have served her better had not his position rested on military force alone. For peace, unity, and riddance of the foreigner were aims worthy of a statesman and a patriot. During an active campaign in South Germany, his successor Gallus, with the young king of Hungary as nominal chief, retook Ratisbon, one of Bernard's brilliant captures the year before, and Donarwürth, and besieged Nordlingen. To save the town, Bernard, though greatly outnumbered, risked a two days battle which resulted in an overwhelming defeat. South Germany was overrun by the Catholic armies and permanently lost to Protestantism. In the general overthrow disappeared the Duchy of Franconia, which had been the reward of Bernard's services. Even more than after Lützen were the gold and good offices of France required to salvage the wreck of Protestantism. This state of affairs roused in John George greater resentment towards France than he had felt towards Sweden. By the Treaty of Prague, in 1635, he came at last to terms with the Emperor. 1. The year 1627 was substituted for 1552 as the test year. All lands then held by the Protestants were to be retained, and these included most of the northern bishoprics. 2. Lusatia was made over to Saxony. 3. Lutheranism was to be tolerated in Silesia and in certain imperial towns, but nowhere was Calvinism recognized. So many German princes availed themselves of an invitation to share the benefits of the treaty that the war might most advantageously have been ended at this point. But Oxenstierna rejected the peace, because it gave Sweden no German territory whatever, while France and Spain were still far from concluding their rivalry, which had become the mainspring of the war. The last, or French, period of the Thirty Years' War, therefore, began in 1635. 
the battle of nordlingen gave richelieu the opening for which his plans were carefully laid in return for his help he demanded from the swedes the fortresses of alsace french garrisons were already protecting those of the elector of treves and french armies already occupied lorraine as long as the dutch were masters of the sea the control of these provinces would enable france to close in upon her enemy in the netherlands with the fortresses in his hands richelieu declared war upon spain a fourfold plan of operations included the expulsion of the spaniards from milan the defence of lorraine a campaign under bernard on the right bank of the rhine and the invasion of the spanish netherlands in alliance with the dutch but since the peace of fifteen fifty nine france had not moved with the times in war old-fashioned weapons ignorant officers and undisciplined soldiers brought upon her reverses all the more bitter because unexpected everywhere failure met the french arms but when the spaniards actually planned to march on paris the national spirit rose and men and money poured in for the sake of a quiet life the new emperor ferdinand the third sixteen thirty seven to sixteen fifty seven who succeeded his father would have tolerated the protestants he was a man of formal piety colourless character and devoted to account-keeping but he was too much influenced by his spanish queen's relations to take an independent line germany was now no more than a battleground for the settlement of swedish and french interests in the north banner and tortenson struggled against saxony to secure pomerania for sweden winning one overwhelming victory at wittstock and making an occasional diversion into austria or bohemia the french armies under bernard contested the rhine frontier and districts with the empire in spain in one or other of these regions the closing interest of the war is centred after three disastrous years the french began to profit by experience bernard overran the upper rhineland and the breisgau taking breisach against superior numbers with masterly rapidity richelieu's famous consolation to his dying friend courage father joseph breisach is ours was prophetic for bernard who looked forward to ruling the conquered lands in place of his lost duchy died at the early age of thirty-five in july sixteen thirty nine before he could strike another blow no one remained to dispute with richelieu the dismemberment of the empire and the grasp of france closed upon alsace meanwhile the exhaustion of spain the heritage of philip the second's reign was becoming apparent his feeble successor philip the third had contributed further to its downfall by senseless ostentation and extravagance and by driving out the moriscos the most industrious of his subjects his peaceful foreign policy prevented any open exposure of spain's weakness for the truce with the dutch was only a long delayed conclusion to that struggle but under philip the fourth the break-up of the great spanish empire set in the real ruler the able and enterprising favourite olivarez drew closer the ties between spain and austria but in so doing he provoked the ill will of richelieu who proved more than his match in the valtellina and in mantua france took the upper hand by imitating in spain richelieu's policy of crushing all opposition to the crown olivarez drove the wild but loyal catalans into revolt and france abetting the rebellion finally forced her way into roussillon in sixteen thirty nine while the portuguese were encouraged to recover their own independence the reign of philip the second had seen the union of the whole peninsula under the spanish crown under his grandson the house of braganza was set once more upon the throne of portugal through richelieu's fostering care the french navy became formidable enough to give spain trouble a great spanish fleet bound in sixteen thirty nine for the netherlands avoided a french squadron only to fall into the clutches of the dutch claiming the protection of english neutrality 
the Spaniards took refuge in the Downs, but Van Tromp, flouting Charles I's weak government, fell upon the Spanish ships and drove what he did not destroy to take shelter in Dunkirk. Under Mazarin, the appearance of real military capacity began to compensate for his financial incapacity and the difficulties which beset Anne of Austria's regency. From Rocroi, 1643, dates the supremacy of France in war, which remained unbroken till the Battle of Blenheim. The Spanish army in the Netherlands, thinking to turn to account the weakness of the regency, laid siege to Rocroi on the French frontier. The Spanish position was formidable, but fortified by the advice of an officer who had seen Gustavus fling himself upon Tilly's ponderous squares at Breitenfeld, Donguillon, better known as Prince of Condé, resolved to fight. Applying the lesson taught by Gustavus's use of cavalry, Condé bade his infantry follow in the track of his artillery fire and launch themselves upon the disorganized Spanish formation. The Spanish veterans, unable to maneuver, fell in an iron ring round the chair of their gouty old leader, the Count of Fuentes, defenceless but unyielding, a fitting end to the undisputed supremacy of the Spanish infantry. Meanwhile, Turenne, a greater though less dashing soldier than Condé, was endeavouring at great cost of life to secure the French conquests of the Rhineland, the world was languishing for peace, but it was clear that until the emperor was deprived of the last of his allies, he would not submit to its terms. Turenne, with the Swedes under Wrangel, Torstenson's successor, therefore decided to strike at Bavaria. Having crossed the Danube, they presented themselves at the gates of Munich and proceeded to lay waste the rich Bavarian plain which for thirteen years had escaped the horrors of war. Bitter necessity wrung from Maximilian a truce, but in a few months he was again at the emperor's side. Vengeance was exacted to the uttermost by Turenne and Wrangel, and Bavaria was wasted by fire and sword. In the last battle of the war at Sous Marshausen, Ferdinand plainly had his back to the wall. At Osnabrück, he therefore concluded peace with the Protestant powers headed by Sweden, and at Münster with the Catholic powers, not including Spain, led by France. The two treaties are better known by the title of the Peace of Westphalia, 1648. The religious difficulties were settled as follows. 1. Calvinists were to share all the privileges of their Lutheran fellow Protestants. 2. All church lands were to be secured in the possession of those, whether Catholics or Protestants, who held them on January 1st, 1624. 3. As in the Chambre mi parti of Huguenot France, an equal number of judges of both religions were to sit in the imperial chamber. The political clauses ran thus. 1. Maximilian of Bavaria and his descendants were confirmed in the electorate, to which was added the upper palatinate. The lower palatinate was restored to Frederick V's son with the title of elector. 2. Sweden was recognized as a member of the empire and controlled the mouths of the Oder, the Elba, and the Weser through her new possessions of western Pomerania and the bishoprics of Bremen and Verden. 3. Eastern Pomerania fell to Brandenburg, together with most of Magdeburg and the bishoprics of Halberstadt and Minden. 4. The rest of Magdeburg with Lusatia passed to Saxony. 5. France received Alsace accepting the free city of Strasbourg and was confirmed in her possession of the bishoprics of Metz, Toul, and Verdun. 6. The independence of Switzerland and of Holland was formally recognized. Thus the great religious problem was resolved in a practical form, not by preaching the ideal advantages of toleration, but by leaving in the hands of Catholic and Protestant rulers states that as early as 1624 had made their final decision for Catholicism and Protestantism respectively, and that there was so little subsequent persecution proved the success of the arrangement. 
In other ways, however, Germany had suffered much. The already shadowy imperial power became more of a phantom than ever. The empire was merely a collection of states, each under a ruler with full sovereign rights. Among these rulers, the emperor, as Archduke of Austria and King of Hungary and Bohemia, happened to be numbered, and in these dominions his interest entirely merged itself. He turned his face to the southeast, leaving the northwest to be developed by his sturdy rival, Brandenburg. The peace found Germany a desert, and it was clear that its recovery would take at least a century. About two-thirds of the total population had disappeared. The misery of those that survived was piteous in the extreme. Five-sixths of the villages in the empire had been destroyed. We read of one in the Palatinate that in two years had been plundered twenty-eight times. In Saxony, flocks of wolves roamed about, for in the north quite one-third of the land had gone out of cultivation, and trade had drifted into the hands of the French or Dutch. Education had almost disappeared, and the moral decline of the people was seen in the coarsening of manners and the growth of superstition, as witnessed by the frequent burning of witches. Beyond Germany, the peace showed considerable alteration in the relative importance of various European powers. The decline of the Pope's political influence was marked by the quiet indifference which met his refusal to recognize the treaties. Spain, though saved from a tragic fall by the comic interlude called the Fronde, could no longer hide from the world her decay. France had immeasurably strengthened her frontier, and the lust of conquest began fatally to link her fortunes with the idea of the Rhine boundary. Sweden had gained what Gustavus Adolphus had set forth to claim, the supremacy of the Baltic and a great European position. In furtherance of this policy, his devoted servant, Oxenstierna, made war on Denmark, drove the Danes from the southern provinces of Sweden, and freed his country from all payment of tolls in the Sound in 1645. From mistaken attachment to their master's aims, Oxenstierna and the nobles were strongly opposed to peace, but the young queen's determination in its favor carried the day. During her minority, Oxenstierna and the nobles had provided Sweden with the first of fixed or written constitutions, organizing the state on the basis of Lutheranism and aristocratic government. But Christina's masterful personality left no doubt where the real power lay. She made her court the intellectual center of Europe, and in the union of mental gifts and force of character, she is the most remarkable sovereign of the seventeenth century. Vigorous in mind and body, straightforward, thick-skinned, and brave as a lion, she unhesitatingly followed her convictions. These led her to insist upon the peace, to secure the succession of her cousin because she declined to marry, and in 1654 to abdicate the crown after her conversion to Roman Catholicism. At the age of twenty-eight she left Sweden and finally settled down as the center of a literary circle in Rome. Charles X succeeded her, in whose short, brilliant reign Sweden reached the height of her greatness. The war between France and Spain was renewed in 1653, yet though Spain had recovered many of her losses in the previous four years, neither power was in a state to deal a telling stroke. Condé, commanding in the Netherlands, held his own on the French frontier against Turenne, but in 1657 Cromwell, whose advances towards Spain had been repulsed, turned to France and reinforced Turenne with six thousand of the finest soldiers in Europe. Mardic and Dunkirk, and a series of fortresses in Flanders, fell into their hands, and Dunkirk became English property. The death of Ferdinand III strengthened Mazarin's influence in Germany with the effect of isolating Spain, while Cromwell's death relieved him of an inconveniently powerful ally. Spain was languishing for peace. The preliminaries arranged in the famous Isle of Pheasants in the Bidasoa, 1659, resulted in the Treaty of the Pyrenees. It completed for France the Treaty of Westphalia, 
by securing her southern frontier as the former treaty had secured that on the east and southeast and left her the real mistress of western europe one roussillon cerdagne artois and a number of flemish fortresses were handed over to france two the duke of lorraine recovered his duchy under french supervision three conde was pardoned and restored four louis the fourteenth was to marry the infanta maria theresa the last clause was full of importance for the future though the infanta for a handsome dowry renounced her claims as next in the succession to her weakly brother charles the second the money was never raised thus the renunciation was held in some quarters to be invalid and became the means of opening another exhausting struggle the war of the spanish succession end of section twenty eight read by pamela nagami m d in encino california february twenty twenty two end of europe and renaissance and reformation fourteen fifty three to sixteen sixty by mary a hollings